Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And hopefully, you didn't miss the amazing thing in naval history that happened last week. Like myself, I'm sure many of you guys grew up and first got interested in these ships through some of the underwater exploration and marine archaeology that uh, has happened on a lot of these famous shipwrecks. Uh, for example, my grandparents had the National Geographic documentaries on Dr. Ballard finding Titanic and Bismarck on VHS. Every time I went over Nana and Pop Pops, uh, God bless them, uh, they would let me sit there and watch those documentaries. I, I cannot imagine how many times I made them watch it. While other kids were watching Winnie the Pooh or whatever else, I was watching those documentaries. That's one of the things that I love about uh, that kind of underwater exploration is that once they've done that, that survey, they then have to release scholarly work, a documentary, a book. I have a, a, a book on finding Bismarck's wreck signed by Dr. Ballard. Like the, these sorts of things that then help the public uh, learn about, understand these shipwrecks. And in a lot of ways, that is what uh, has made these ships famous. I've had a little bit of a love-hate relationship with uh, some of the Vanity Project underwater archaeology that's, hap that's happened in the last couple of years um, because, yes, they're finding these amazing shipwrecks, but they're not creating the, the scholarly works uh, that, that the public is able to consume uh, so we can learn more about what happened to these ships. And uh, I've been worried that, that these, what, what I call the Vanity Project uh, underwater exploration stuff, will uh, make it so that there are no wrecks left for the professional uh, searchers who, who need to fundraise to do these sorts of projects. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong about that. This past week, the Ocean Exploration Trust, and more specifically their vessel, the exploration vessel Nautilus, did a uh, extremely deep sea survey of some wrecks that had been previously discovered. Uh, specifically, the, the wrecks that we've discovered from the Battle of Midway. So they dove on the aircraft carrier Yorktown, which was first found by Dr. Ballard back in 99, uh, I think. And then they also dove the wrecks of Kaga and Akagi, which were found by the uh, researchers on Petrol a couple of years ago. And uh, Kaga was dove on and looked at, but Akagi, they found her on the sonar, they knew from the size of the sonar readout and the location that had to be her, but they were not able to, to send a, uh, an ROV down to actually film the wreck. So this was the first time since June of 1942 that anybody was able to see the aircraft carrier Akagi, flagship of the strike force that attacked Pearl Harbor and uh, of the Japanese fleet during the Battle of Midway. And what is amazing about this particular exploration, they live streamed the whole thing. They had experts on, uh, including my friend uh, Frank from Naval History and Heritage Command, who had been a part of the group that uh, found Akagi and uh, Kaga with Petrol, and uh, a number of other experts to, to talk about what they were finding in live time on the live stream. So part of this video today is just to point you over, um, and there's a link in the description below, so that you can go over and click and see some of the footage of these shipwrecks. And uh, I'm sure like you, it will rekindle your love of maritime history. Like, man, it was so amazing sitting there in, in real time and watching them dive on and hearing the, the drone operators talk about it. Now, one, one of the uh, special things is uh, I believe when Dr. Ballard first found Yorktown, they're looking down on her from the top. So you, you get a very specific view from that angle. But these ROVs were able to go down and uh, look at the side of the ship. So, so they spent something like 12 hours on each wreck going down the side of the ship and around the back and, and back the other way and checking the edge of the flight deck and the hangars and, and the, uh, the water line. And they were able to, to find out some things about these vessels that we never knew before. And, and let me tell you, your model of Yorktown is wrong. Your model of Akagi is wrong. Like, that, that's one of the things I love about this. Is we've now seen what these ships look like at the battle. 
and they had some stuff that we weren't aware of, that, that don't make it into the, the model kit. That, that Ravel model kit of Yorktown we all built as a kid, guns aren't in the right place. Uh, so for those of you who missed the live stream and didn't get to participate in this in real time, which was freaking amazing, there, there is, a, like I said, the 10-minute video linked below. This, this shows some of the highlights and uh, some, of, some of the great things that uh, the, the different experts who, who were speaking were able to say. This is really, really important, not just because of what it uh, does for public interest in this kind of history, it helps the Navy because the Navy hasn't been in any battle since World War II like this, like where, where ships are being sunk like this. So the, the sorts of damage assessments that they are able to do from looking at these wrecks are important. It's, it's important from a, a heritage standpoint, a cultural heritage standpoint that, that we've been able to find these wrecks. It's important for the families of the folks who died on board, whose loved ones don't have a grave. These shipwrecks are their fit and final resting place. And, of course, it's important from a research point of view for historians like myself. So some of the things that I saw that were absolutely amazing, uh, one, they were able to reiterate how great a shape Yorktown was in. And, and again, she, she is sitting there on the seafloor, upright, relatively intact. The, the flight deck is there. there there's um, at least one bomb hole and some fire damage. but. She, she is there, the guns are mostly pointing sky high, and we knew this from Ballard's original 1999 expedition, but now that we were able to go down and look at the side of the ship, we were not just looking top down, we, we were able to look at the gun tubs along the sides of the ship, and I've already mentioned this before, uh, but Yorktown had some extra guns that I don't think we knew about before, at least I'm not aware of. In addition to the 20 millimeter guns that were added on the uh, port side of the ship primarily, there are a couple places in the footage where you can see 50 cals on the bow and on the starboard side of the ship. So it seems like her original 50 caliber battery uh, that had been replaced with 20 millimeters, they didn't replace it, they kept them. They, they remounted them somewhere else to keep that extra firepower because of how uh, potent aircraft were at that point in the war and how little anti-aircraft guns there were to distribute to the fleet. Yorktown's anti-aircraft battery was weaker than Enterprise and Hornet. She didn't have as many 20 millimeter guns. And it turns out her crew knew that and they somehow acquired these extra guns and mounted them. Interestingly, uh, the guns themselves are very badly corroded, much more so than the 20 millimeters or the 1.1s or the 5 inches. The uh, 50 cals heat up tremendously. They're water-cooled guns. They were probably fired so much that they heated up to the point that their protective coatings, I think they were, would have been parkerized, probably melted off the barrels. And they corroded much more than the other guns around them. Uh, likewise, there were 20 millimeter gun mounts on the uh, fantail on that lower level, not, not on the edges of the flight deck where they are on Enterprise and Hornet, but on that lower level at the back of the ship. And I've never seen those before. So it was amazing seeing as the ROV goes around, you can see some of the letters of the name still on the stern. And then above them, there are a couple of 20 millimeters still pointed at the sky. Another really awesome thing about Yorktown, her port side guns, many of them the gun tubs had square cuts and the shielding wasn't there anymore. As part of the damage control efforts to try and save that ship, she had uh, something like a, a 23 or 24 degree list to port. They went and they cut a lot of the uh, armor plated shielding, relatively thin, but, but the, the steel shielding away from the guns and they unshipped many of the guns. The, a lot of the uh, port side 20 millimeters are not there anymore. They threw them off to try and remove weight so they could try and right the ship. Uh, and likewise, the uh, forwardmost port side five inch gun position, there were two five inch gun mounts there originally. The shields for both of them had been cut away and one of the two guns was unshipped. It didn't shear off in the fall. In the footage, you can actually see the bolts sticking through the deck 
or, or the, I should say the studs, and they've been unbolted and the gun's been removed. It was removed intentionally to save weight. And that's, that's incredible. And I'm sure that's helpful for the Navy because the, the Navy does sink axes, but those ships are unmanned. This is seeing what a ship with a, a very skilled damage control party was trying to do to salvage the ship. And they would have succeeded had she not then been torpedoed by, uh, I think it was I-125, uh, was the Japanese submarine that, that sank her in Hamid. Uh, so, so they were doing all of these things to try and uh, save the ship. And you read about it in the book, the damage control parties go back on board and they try to save the ship. Okay, cool. Now we've seen the evidence of, of some of what they were able to do. And this was amazing because um, we, we, we got a very superficial look at these ships. Much better detail than we've ever seen before, but they couldn't go inside the ships. Um, this is another amazing thing. If you guys are seasick or, or get seasick or motion sick, it might be difficult to watch the footage because the camera keeps bobbing up and down. And so at some point during the stream, somebody asks, hey, can, can you hold the ROV stationary? And, and the pilot said, no, they can't. The bobbing up and down is the uh, Nautilus three miles above them bobbing up and down in the ocean. And the ROV is attached by this three mile long cord that, uh, and so as that ship three miles up is bobbing up and down, your, your camera down here is bobbing up and down. So, so that happens in the footage a lot. Uh, fortunately, it was a relatively smooth day. It's not that much uh, bobbing going on, but ah, so cool to watch. Um, but, but because of that and the delay between when they send a signal and when it's gone through three miles of electrical wire to get down to uh, this thing, they couldn't like go into the hangar or go through the bomb hole or they would have, they could have lost the, the ROV. So they had to stay off of the side of the ship. They couldn't even go like under the underhang of the flight deck because that's jagged metal. If the ship up three miles up rises, it could uh, cut them. Uh, so, so that was some of the cool stuff we saw in Yorktown. Akagi and Kaga, um, it, it was devastating looking at those ships. They, they, they were uh, nearly as large as Battleship New Jersey. They big, powerful vessels and they were absolutely destroyed and you're looking at them and and you you realize that a, a lot of people died on those ships and they're still there uh they, they never went anywhere else um they they are in significantly worse shape both from the the bomb and fire damage that they took during the battle and also from corrosion and that was an interesting thing to see as well the fires that ravaged these ships melted the paint coatings off. And so they had bare steel, which, which was fire damaged, which is uh, steel that's been heated up corrodes even faster than, than regular steel. So th those ships were significantly more damaged and significantly more corroded from their 80 years on the seabed. Um, That, that was some awesome footage as well. Like I said before, it was the first time we ever got to see Akagi. Um, some things we learned, her five inch guns did not have shields on them. I've, I've read in, in books that the shields were, the, the shields limited the visibility of the gun crew, but many historians believe that they were left on there uh, in part to protect the gun crew from the exhaust gases. But this shows another wartime modification of these ships that we didn't know about. Because the anti-aircraft guns are so important, they removed the gun shield so that they would have better visibility in engaging aircraft. And just like on Yorktown, her guns that are still intact are pointing skywards. In the footage, you'll even see one of the, the I'm going to say 5 inch, I think they're actually 120 millimeters, they're a little below 5 inch. Uh, but one of the twin mounts is blown off of its mounting point and it's laying upside down in its gun tub and you can tell because of the, the uh, it's like a half moon gearing that would have been what elevated and uh, depressed it. So be, be sure to watch the footage and see if you can find it. Le leave the exact minute marker in the comments down below so that other folks can find it as well. Uh, but you can really see the damage 
uh, wrought on these ships, especially Akagi and Kaga, more, more so than, than on Yorktown, where much of the crew was able to orderly evacuate, and they had a lot of time before she sank, and, and they were really able to control the fires. It was the progressive flooding that eventually got her. Uh, and, and so she looks almost like a museum ship preserved there. The footage really makes you realize that, that these are more than ships. They were homes, that they were where people worked and, and were fighting for their lives as they unshipped guns to throw them overboard or, or aim these guns skyward to try and drive away dive bombers. Uh, you can imagine them trying to fight the fires that, that completely ravaged the ships inside and out. Uh, it's really incredible to see. And that's one of the things that makes museum ships so special we uh, visit battlefields to see where these things happened. I live not that far from Gettysburg. Um, for, I li used to live near Fort McHenry when I was in Baltimore. Like visiting the, these battlefields is really important to us. Um, but you can't do that for naval battles. It's just, it's just a flat patch of ocean. So you come and visit museum ships. But things like what the Ocean Exploration Trust did by live streaming this allowed us to visit the Midway Battlefield and see some of the places. That there aren't monuments there like there are at Gettysburg. There are just these ships, the tombstones to the thousands of sailors who went down with them. And most importantly, this expedition neither took anything off of the wrecks, which I really hate, nor did they leave things on the wrecks, which I also dislike. They, they just surveyed this archaeological site. They were partnered with Navy History and Heritage Command, among a number of other things. So, so this footage uh, has come to naval historians to continue to research it so that we can put out more scholarly material on it. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad this has happened, and I'm so glad that they did this live so that all of us had the chance to watch it along with them. So um, because this was their footage and not ours, uh, and it, I assume it's copywritten in some way, we weren't able to show much of it here on the video. Remember, click that link over and see the 10 minute clip that they released and uh, keep an eye out. I'm sure they will be releasing more footage from the wrecks at some point in the future. So what shipwreck are you hoping they explore next? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We receive no operating support from the Ocean Exploration Trust, uh, and we're not affiliated with them in any way. We're just doing this video, which is my personal thoughts, uh, not endorsed in any way by th this museum or by them, because it's so cool, and I think you guys will think it's cool too. You can support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about us and our museum, or by clicking the donate link in the description below. Thanks for watching.